Welcome to the Wheaton College Aesthetics Lecture for 2022. Making this event uh, a possible are the Baki Endowment for Intellectual and Imaginative Engagement and the Wade Center in collaboration with the Wheaton College Conservatory of Music and the English Department. The sponsorship of the Baki Endowment and the Wade Center is only right for if there's one figure in the world who is the living heir of the Inklings, it is our speaker tonight. The co-sponsorship of music in English also reflects our guest speaker's many talents. Poet, Anglican priest, singer, songwriter, educator on two continents, musician on at least four CDs, and author of over a dozen books, Malcolm Geit continues to explore the frontiers of theology in the imagination like no one else today. Jeremy Begbie of Duke University says, Malcolm Geit has established himself as one of the leading Christian poets of our time. Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, calls Malcolm's book, Faith, Hope, and Poetry, a profound theology of the imagination. Few figures of any time have excelled as both poet and scholar. But our speaker tonight is a creative artist, a literary critic, and a Christian thinker who is leaving his mark on our spiritually needy world. Malcolm Geit was born in Nigeria to British expatriate parents. His father was a Methodist lay minister who actively shared the gospel throughout Nigeria and taught classes at the University of Badan. His mother read him Shakespeare and Milton in the cradle. The parents, um, take heed. <laughs> Raise up future poets and storytellers. Growing up, Malcolm's path led him through Canada and finally to England. He graduated from Cambridge and Durham universities. In his last year as an undergraduate, he wrote a literary paper analyzing the Psalms that he likened to a conversion experience. This was a very important moment in his life. He chose to be confirmed in the Church of England shortly thereafter. So tonight, this topic he will speak on is very dear to his heart. And as many of you doubtless notice, the title of his talk is inspired by Lewis's famous 1958 book, Reflections on the Psalms. Reviewers are uniformly enthusiastic about the contributions Malcolm has made. Of his numerous books, I want to commend them all, but especially his most recent book, David's Crown. While many of us were hiding out during the pandemic, Malcolm's pen was busily at work, writing his magnificent terza rima poetic sounding of all 150 psalms. It is organized, as he explains, as a corona, with a nod to the plague of our time, but also a crown to God our Savior, who redeems us from all our troubles. The book's grand coronal structure ends where it began. In the cycle, Malcolm explains, he reads and prays the Psalter in the spirit first of its having been read and prayed by our intercessor, Christ. And second, as in some sense inspired prophecy of his inner experience. And so of my experience in him, he says, and his in me. What Malcolm creates in this rich interplay is a poetic prayer journal, as he modestly calls it. But I would say it connects earth and heaven as does nothing else in contemporary poetry. Brief note on the evening's format. We will have our evening lecture here without question and answer. But uh, when the lecture is over, we will all convene out in the lobby uh, for our reception and continue our conversation there. So please bring your questions. Finally, Malcolm's long converse with poets and thinkers has made him the intellectual figure he is today. His poetic tribute to George Herbert could just as well be said about his own treasured works. Your manuscript entrusted to a friend has been entrusted now to every soul. We make a new beginning in your end and find your broken heart has made us whole. But you haven't come to hear me read from his poems tonight, but from the poet himself. Please give a warm welcome to our distinguished guest, Malcolm Geit.
Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, that very warm introduction. Um, my ears were burning. Also, you know, after that build-up, it's all downhill from here. But uh, it's a joy to be with you. It's been wonderful to return to Wheaton. I was here, I think it was four years ago, although the, the pandemic makes it so difficult to remember what year is which. It's, we've had kind of two years in parenthesis, haven't we, really? And we're trying to reconnect the sequence. Um, but I was here with Dr. Michael Ward and uh, talking about Lewis and uh, Dante. And my title, uh, Reflections on the Psalms, is, is indeed, as, as you've been told, a nod to uh, Lewis. And I want, in a sense, to use just one or two comments um, from Lewis's reflections, which I was rereading in the, in the Wade um, just today. And um, also, they have a, some of the manuscript of, of, of the text of that written out in his beautiful work, with scarcely a jot, scarcely a, a crossing out, just flowing from his mind. He, he began to conceive of that, um, that, that book uh, and get the first ideas for it in 1957, which is the year I was born. So I'm sort of um, coeval with reflections on the Psalms. But one of the things he says very early, and it's lovely that we've got some real, um, Leland here, the, people who've understood the richness of understanding the Bible as literature in all its literary forms, as well as, you know, of course, it's being God-breathed. He, by way of almost um, prologue or excuse for the poetic approach I'm going to take and the, the poetic journey through the Psalms I want to take you on, um, I'll just give you a couple of comments from Lewis in Reflections on the Psalms. When I came to write David's Crown, which is really what I'm going to draw from this evening, uh, when I realized what an enormous project I'd begun, <laughs> I, 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 I returned to reflections on the Psalms and, and bathed myself in it and drew from it again and again in terms of helping me discern my own path through the Psalter. So here's a couple of things that Lewis says about reflections on the Psalms. First of all, he says that they are emphatically poetry. <laughs> The Psalms are poems and poems, this is Lewis now, the Psalms are poems and poems intended to be sung, not doctrinal treatises, not even sermons. They must be read as poems, as lyrics, with all the license and all the formalities. Isn't that a lovely balanced pair there? On the one hand, you do have poetic license. You can exaggerate, you can, you can conflate, you can come up with a new image, you can turn an image into a metaphor and then an emblem. That's license. But there's also the beautiful formalities of poetry. It's courtesy towards form and rhythm. And of course, Lewis very beautifully expounds the parallelism in the psalm and, and delicately calls it a thought rhyme. Wonderful. So it is lyrics with all the license and all the formalities uh, the, lyric, uh, uh, the lyric has with all the, the hyperboles, the emotional rather than log logical connections which are proper to lyric poetry. So that's essential. You can't reduce the poetry of the Psalms to a kind of single level ticker tape doctrinal account or seize passages out of context. You he hear them as poetry. But what do we, do we mean uh, by that? That's, uh, I'll give you a second passage from, from uh, these are both from the, the introduction to reflections on the Psalms. Jesus, uh, Jesus of course, had the Psalms on his lips in the beginning, almost certainly lent them from his mother. Um, Lewis points out that, um, that, that there's something very psalmic about the Magnificat, that his mother was already making her own creative poetic response to the book of Psalms. Um, but he says, you know, with the measure you meet, that shall be measured to you with all. You know, knock and the door will be opened. Seek and you will find. Ask and you will receive. That sense of constantly piling up parallel phrases and balancing them all out. That Jesus, he feels, is, is himself speaking the poetry of the Psalms. And this is what, what Lewis says. It seems to me appropriate, almost inevitable, that when that great imagination, capital I, 
when that great imagination, which in the beginning, for its own delight and for the delight of men and angels and in their proper mode of beasts, had invented and formed the whole world of nature. It's a wonderful account of the creation. There's the God, the divine creation as the imagination. The logos there, not so much as the reason in, in God, but as the imagination. When that great imagination, which had formed the world, when that great imagination and here's the beautiful thing, submitted to express itself in human speech, was incarnate, took up words. When that great imagination submitted to express itself in human speech, that speech should sometimes be poetry. For poetry too, this is just a gem from Lewis, poetry too is a little incarnation, giving body, to what has been before invisible and inaudible. So there's a defense of, uh, there's a kind of account of creation as a kind of poetry. Now, in fact, I think uh, he's not only riffing a little bit when he speaks of a little incarnation, on, obviously on the prologue to John's Gospel. I think he's riffing Lewis here when he says, giving body to what has been before invisible and inaudible. Poetry, too, is a little incarnation. I think he's alluding very gently to the great passage in A Midsummer Night's Dream in which Shakespeare gives perhaps his best and fullest and most, most evocative account of what poetry is. You remember, you remember that, that passage where, where Theseus says, um, the poet's eye in a fine frenzy rolling doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and as imagination bodies forth the form of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. And there's something in Shakespeare's setup there, heaven, earth, earth, heaven, um, that moment of juxtaposing imagination and bodies, bodies forth, is, which I think itself riffs on the prologue to John's Gospel, if you think about it. You begin, you begin that, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. It's brilliant. You think, oh my, this is great philosophy, but I can't see it. You know, I know, I know it must be incredibly profound, and um, I'm going to, I shall, you know, think about the Logos, Enarche, and her Logos, her Logos, Prostonte, and wonderful. But where do we come in? You know, <laughs> how do we even get a hold of that? Shakespeare contrasts what we can apprehend with what we can comprehend. Imagination apprehends more than cool reason ever comprehends. We can't quite get to it. But then comes verse 14, after all that, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among, and we beheld, and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so imagination bodies forth the form of things unknown, gives to airy nothing, a local habitation and a name. And of course, in the Vulgate, I mean, Shakespeare would, of course, for Midsummer Night's Dream, not have had the authorised version because that didn't come out till 1611. He might have had the Dewey, possibly the Geneva. But he would certainly, even with his small Latin and less Greek, have known the Vulgate. And of course, the first question, Magister, the first question of the disciples, to, the, to Jesus in John in the Vulgate, Magister, ubi habitas, where is your habitation? So all that, just a little insight from Lewis, that there is something about incarnation happening in poetry. There is a bodying forth. Poetry too, says Lewis, is a little incarnation, giving body to what would have been before invisible and inaudible. Gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. So that's really by way of excuse for saying <laughs> that um, if we consider the Psalms as poetry and we, disc and we, 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 we consider that, that a response to poetry as poetry, with poetry, not simply with critical analysis, and there are plenty of very good books of critical analysis of the Psalms, but perhaps the creative thing is to make a creative response and to see how the two can meet. For one poem to beget another, that's how the whole tradition of poetry works. You know, Virgil couldn't have written the Aeneid without the Iliad 
I mean, he kind of, you know, he, and he's constantly alluding to Homer, but giving a much more focused kind of story. So uh, I began to feel that perhaps my own reflections on the Psalms would not be, certainly not prose as lucid as C.S. Lewis's, but would need to be poetic. But there was something else, and that was um, the whole extraordinary event of the pandemic. And so let me tell you how this started, um, just to be anecdotal for a minute. Um, on, I think it was, it was early in March, maybe it was the 19th or 20th, the, we knew something was happening, we were at the beginning, but the Prime Minister just came on, um, on the TV one evening and said, stay at home. And it was a complete lockdown. We were not to leave our houses except for, you know, absolute necessary shopping, except for, except for exercise once a day for an hour. That was it. So it was this extraordinary thing. And um, as a priest, of course, one's, um, one's reciting the Psalter gradually over the course of, of, of time through, through the lectionary. And I, sort of old-fashioned enough, to, I always find the way the modern lecturers dodge about is quite difficult. So I was using the lectionary as Cramner sets it out in the Book of Common Prayer, which is quite a lot of psalms a day. I mean, and sometimes I didn't make it, to be honest. But I thought, well, there's no excuse for not doing it now. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to treat this as day one in that table in the BCP with Coverdale's beautiful translation, 16th century translation. And I'm going to go to it. So, of course... Um, I began at the very beginning, you know, a very good place to begin, the opening psalm. And in, let's just go there. This, by the way, is the very, very beautiful, um, beautiful page of that opening psalm, Beatus Veer, blessed is the man. Now, why do we say Beatus Veer? When it was such a new thing to translate the psalms into English, people still had, they were used to having heard it in Latin and used to having heard the gorgeous opening syllables in Latin of each of these psalms, you know, Beatus Vir, or hear the poetry in, in, you know, the agonizing tragedy, but beautiful, beautiful poignancy of Psalm 22. Deus, Deus, Meus. Huh? They were used to that. So um, when Coverdale translated it, he kept the first two or three Latin words of the old translation, just so you could locate yourself. Oh, and of course, if you'd loved the sound, but you never knew what it was about, you just liked it when they went deus, deus, meus. Imagine when he went, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, there must have been so many wonderful moments when the scripture would be, which had been, if you like, in the Latin, a beautiful decorated scabbard. Suddenly the sharp two-edged sword <laughs> was drawn from it, piercing to the division of joint and marrow. But we were given, as it were, the scab, we were given, we were given the Latin, so Beatus Fear. But Beatus Fear is very good, blessed is the man, because in Beatus is, of course, the word Beatitude. The Beatitudes of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount are all, we're all in the Latin, Beatus, blessed are the poor, for, you know, theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are the meek, you know, blessed are the peacemakers. Beatus, Beatus. And the whole Psalter begins with a blessing. Um, so, um, it, the lockdown had happened. I was going out for my exercise. And for my exercise that morning, I knew I would have several others of the Psalms, but I, I, I have a little walk along a stream in the village where I lived, and there's a beautiful, beautiful great chestnut tree that grows right down by the river, its roots almost into the river. And uh, it was just coming into leaf, it was early spring, it was a warm spring, and there's a little bridge over the river where I would stand and contemplate. So, um, I hope this is legible. I think we better have this rather than the beautiful illuminations. You probably can't read the illuminations. So, I went off and began to chant Beatus Fear. Blessed is the man that hath not walked, there was I walking. Uh, Blessed is the man that hath not walked in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stood in the way of sinners, and hath not sat in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And this was the phrase that somehow cut through to me. 
and in his law will he exercise himself day and night. And in the first trauma of the lockdown, that just suddenly seemed to me to come almost with the force of a command that I was going to need more than one kind of exercise and that I would exercise myself in two senses. I would walk out. Um, and then I'm thinking of this. I'm literally exercising myself. I knew this. And then I came to the little bridge and gazed again at this tree that I'd gazed at so often and found, and he shall be like a tree planted by the waterside that will bring forth his fruit in due season. His leaf also shall not wither, and look, whatsoever he doeth, it shall prosper. And there was something about the rooted tree. Now, I had a slightly crazy thought as I stood on that first morning's permitted exercise, exercising myself in the Beatus Vir. I had been reading, little knowing how great Dunn would, John Dunn would be for this lockdown. I'd been rereading some of Dunn's holy sonnets and particularly the beautiful sequence of seven sonnets that he wrote for Christ, offering it as a crown to Christ, beginning, deign at my hands this crown of prayer and praise, and also ending, last line, deign at my hands this crown of prayer and praise. And that little sequence is called La Corona, because it is a crown or coronet. And the last line of the first sonnet is the first line of the next sonnet, the last line of that, the first line, through to the seventh sonnet. The last line of the seventh sonnet is the first line of the first sonnet. So it makes this beautiful corona. And as you may know, if you know that sequence, it begins with the Annunciation, has that wonderful line, I mean, one of the best lines in Dunn, where he addresses Mary and thinks about the miracle of the God in whom and for whom and through whom are all things, the logos in which everything is held together and coheres, coming down to be this tiny babe in the womb of Mary. And he contemplates Jesus in the womb before his birth. And you remember he says, immensity cloistered in thy dear womb. Just astonishing poetry. So that corona begins with the Annunciation and goes through the whole story of Christ's mission to us, his coming, all the things through the cross and the resurrection to the ascension. And then as he sees Christ ascended and he says, deign at my hands this crown of, deign, I just say deign to receive this crown. So I was standing on this bridge thinking I must exercise myself in the Psalms and also recollecting the corona. And then the crazy idea came. What if I wrote a corona? What if for this coronavirus, what if I understood because in the Psalms I see foreshadowed, because Psalm 22 shows me that they're foreshadowed, the passion of Christ. But I feel, I know that the passion of Christ is his in love taking on your suffering and mine. John Donne in his pre-bend sermons as Dean of St. Paul's says that because the Psalms are prophetic of Christ, they are also prophetic of every Christian, of every person who is in Christ. When he preaches on the psalm where David says, because thou hast been my helper, therefore under the shadow of thy wings I shall rejoice, he locates that in Christ. When Christ is assaulted, when Christ is tempted, I have trusted in you, I will trust in you, the agony of the garden. And then he points to bits in his own life and he asks his hearers to think of the times when they're almost ready to give up, to remember the times when God has been your helper, and therefore say, and so wherever you are in life, there is somewhere, as long as you remain in Christ in you, and Christ in you, however deep, however dark soever uh, your suffering, you can find yourself in the Psalms. And if you keep reading that Psalm, you will get to a yet, or a nevertheless, and you will nevertheless, even Psalm 22, yet thou continuest holy upon the throne of praises. So I thought Corona, why did I think Corona? Because I feel in the end that the sufferings of the world that God sent his son to save because he loves it so much are what Christ takes on in the agony of the passion. And that in some sense, even this, this our Corona <laughs> was part of the Corona Spinia, the crown of thorns. 
And there's a very beautiful 16th century Missa Corona Spinia, which I So anyway, it all came together in a kind of moment, and I thought, oh, why don't I write, instead of done doing seven, why don't I write a corona of 150 poems on the Psalms, you know, in iambic pentameter. Oh, and I, that'd be cool, I could do, I could do five verse, I could do them in threes in terza rima, and that way we'd have five um, stanzas in each poem, because the Psalter is divided in the Old Testament into five books. And there would be 15 lines, but since it's iambic pentameter, there'd be 10 syllables, so there'd be 150 syllables each. And we could just, you know, that's a, sorry, it's a bit of a geeky medieval thing with me that I, I like playing with numbers. So, you know, it's just one of these crazy things you think, and I carry on, like time is running out. The British Prime Minister says I have to be home in 10 minutes, you know. Uh, I mean... It's a bit galling now to discover that meantime Boris Johnson was completely ignoring all these rules and kind of having boozy parties in number 10, you know. Um, you know. But anyway, at least I got a book of poetry out of it, so you know, who am I to complain? But so, so, so I just began to think maybe I could do this. I thought it would be a two or three year project. Uh, so I, I came home and started to think what that would be and thought, well, that's cool. I can write the first poem on Beata Sphere. And I thought, no, you can't. Because the form you have chosen compels you always to consider the Psalms as a sequence. You always need to know what is the Psalm that's coming after and what was the Psalm before. Because every time you come to the end, your landing place, that final line, is the springboard for the next poem. So here's the thing. It meant I couldn't write about Psalm 1 until I had completely soaked myself in the final great doxology, the sheer paean of praise that is there in Psalm 150. Because I knew I would be writing towards Psalm 150. Eliot says, in my end is my beginning. <laughs> There's a bit of eschatology for you. And frankly, it was a great piece of eschatology because the journey through the Psalms is harrowing. It's like Christ's harrowing of hell. It, it goes down in, in darkening spirals. Let me read you a little passage I wrote in the introduction, in the preface to this book, about what that journey is. I hope, however, this work can be read as a poem in its own right, divided into 150 linked stanzas, taking you on a journey from the first invitation to be rooted and fruitful like a tree beside the waters, then through all the twists and turns of human experience. It is the experience that Christ in his humanity shares with us. The visionary glimpses of heaven, Psalm 19, yes, but also the sense of hellish darkness and depression. Think of a 130 day profundis. <laughs> Out of the deep, have I called to you, or in another, again, beautiful in Latin, abyssus, abyssum, invocat. Deep calleth unto deep. So a journey, yes, visionary glimpse of heaven, but also the sense of hellish darkness and depression. Delight in the beauties of nature and the warmth of human friendship, but also the awareness of destruction and corruption in both nature and humanity. A journey that leads down to the nadir of despair in Psalm 88. And I'll tell you an extraordinary thing. Psalm 88, which is the only psalm in the entire collection, which has no yet, no nevertheless. It's just my friends and I, my lovers, thou hast put far from it, ends incomplete. But it's the penultimate psalm of book two. And there's a psalm of praise, 89, to follow it. But... Paul Agoode, the New Testament scholar, but who also works on the, on the Psalms, told me this. Because the balance of the numbers isn't exact, because Psalm 119 is so long, when you actually count the verses of the Psalter, thinking of it as a single poem, 88 is right in the middle. It is actually, literally, the hinge and turning point of the entire Psalter. So down to the nadir of despair in Psalm 88, and yet... The, the, it recovers, continues through thick and thin until we renew our courage and return to praise in the great doxology of the fine, five final psalms and come as we did in the opening psalm back to the place where every breath is praised. So I was going to start my thing and I, had to, I soaked myself in 150, which is really great because then all the news was bad. So actually, 
just sheer praise was necessary. So I realized that I needed this one line that would link the two, and the line that came was, come to the place where every breath is praise. That could be the opening invitation, but it could also that at last we finally come to the place where every breath is praised. So once I got that line, I knew we could go on. And this is how the first one came out. And I'll read it to you, not least because it just gives you a sense of how the form works. Terzarima um, has a lovely way of doing things. If you, if you take letters of the alphabet as, as rhyme sounds, it goes A, B, A. So that poor middle line B is orphaned in the verse. It's got, not got a rhyme. But after the gap, before we get to the next, it gets picked up. The next one is B, C, B. And then C that's been orphaned. So then C, D, um, is D, C, and so on. So there's this lovely interlinked, interwoven thing. So here's how the first one came out, which was enough to give me courage to go on. Come to the place where every breath is praise. And God is breathing through each passing breeze. Be planted by the waterside and raise your arms with Christ beneath these rooted trees who lift their breathing leaves up to the skies. Be rooted too, as still and strong as these, open alike to sun and rain. Arise from meditation by these waters. Bear the fruit of that deep rootedness. Be wise in the tree's long wisdom. Learn to share the secret of their patience. Pass the day in their green fastness and their quiet air. Slowly discern a life, a truth, a way where simple being flowers in delight. Then let the chaff of life just blow away. So you see how it works. And of course, let the chaff of life just blow away was, was setting itself up. I haven't went for, um, for the Psalm 2, which is all about the people imagining your vanity and people, people dissing you and having a go at you. So I made that into a whole, you know, I said the, the next one in my sequence goes, then let the chaff of life just blow away. The cynic scoffer and the evil troll, hunters and haters who hold sway in raging Twitter storms. <laughs> The ones who scroll through hate and hit lists in their tiny rage are dust upon the mirror of your soul. Blow them away, <laughs> the idols of this age. So it said something like that. So, so there it was, and you can see why, as it so happened on that first morning, that first psalm spoke directly into the situation. Because if you want a good image for what it feels like to be in lockdown, don't go for a greyhound, go for a tree, because the tree is not going anywhere, <laughs> and neither are you. <laughs> so, there we go. But can I take the opportunity to put down roots? And then, of course, as I went through the whole Psalter, I realized the tree comes up again and again. It's like a series of them. So, that was the opening. And what I want to do now in the time that's left is take you just on a little bit of a, a tour and particularly to show you how certain verses in Coverdale's beautiful translation, its 16th century translation, provided a kind of rhythm and a springboard for me. Now, clearly these are not translations. I'm not offering a fresh translation or even version of the Psalms. Um, certainly be difficult to do the whole of 119 in 15 lines. <laughs> so, but, but, uh, I'm writing a kind of prayer journal. I'm seeing which is the image, which is the part of this that suddenly speaks into this situation. And time and again, I found the language of the Psalms spoke directly into the present crisis, as it speaks again now into the crisis with Ukraine. I mean, I don't know if you saw that thing that the chief rabbi of Kiev at one point when they really thought Kiev might be under complete bombardment asked Christians to join him and the, the Jewish people of Kiev in praying Psalm 31 as vigil. And we, you know, we, we, we all did it and uh, I found my... So let me just take you on this tour. I'm going to have a little look now. I gave you a Psalm too, but let me... Don't worry, when... Um, oh, wait, Psalm 18, we should... Oh, we seem to have gone straight on to Psalm 18, um, rather than having 
Psalm 3. Um, well, actually, that might not be a bad thing, given time. So, um, Psalm, Psalm 3, just so you don't miss it, is, you all know what Psalm 3 is like. Lord, how, they, how are they increased? That, in Latin, it's wonderful. It's like domine quid multiplicati. How come all my troubles are multiplying? It's not even that they're slowly adding up, they're multiplying. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? How many are they that rise against me? Many there be that say of my soul, there's no help for him and his God. Be thou my defender. So my number three was about all the, um, the kind of ramifying difficulties. And then you remember the resolution in Psalm 3. I laid me down and slept and rose up again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of the people that have set against me round about. It's about how, when you can't figure it out for yourself, like a bad multiplication problem that you got lost in the math, quid multiplicati, sleep on it. <laughs> sleep on it. I've not, I've not got it on the slide, but I'll, I'll, I'll read, read you the poem before we, we, we go on to 18. That you may find your peace in his goodwill, call out to him and tell him all your fear. For he will hear you from his holy hill. He knows how many ills both far and near oppress your soul and how they multiply these obstacles and problems. How you veer from one side to the other, from one lie to yet another till there's nothing true. Just let it go for now. Don't even try. Lie down and rest. Let him look after you. And in the morning, when you rise again, then let him lift your head and change your view, replenish, renovate you, and sustain his long, slow blessings in your growing soul till troubles cease and only joys remain. I was writing these, by this time I was well into it, and my poor wife, I was going to say, look, I need two or three hours every day in my heart. I would read the Psalms the night before, meditate on them. Imagine reading that after a troubling day, sleeping on it, and then waking up in the morning and thinking, oh, yes, I can see things differently now. Um, so that's a, a couple of the beginning. But let's turn to Psalm 18, one of the great Psalms, one of the Psalms that I think we can, I mean, the scholars all differ, and, you know, there's, but this is... Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're called the Psalms of David, and um, that's right, because they're in the tradition of David, and there are one or two, I think, that almost certainly were you know, David himself, but obviously later ones, clearly, clearly 137, you know, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept as long, much later, and it's in the exile. But they still call them the Psalms of David, because there was something, David is, in the seed of David is promised the Messiah, and in the end, the Psalms are about the promised help that will come. And that's why the son of David, Jesus Christ, takes the Psalms on his lips with authority and tells the disciples, um, particularly at the end of Luke, I mean, he, not just on the road, he says, you will find me in the Psalms. <laughs> I mean, um, so this one, though, the scholars, to be fair, do actually reckon is a Psalm of David. And uh, I remember hearing uh, at Laity Lodge, hearing... Eugene Peterson talk about his own encounter with the Psalms and how he didn't, he didn't, there was no poetry in his household. There was a deep suspicion of art and symbol and metaphor. These things were never mentioned. And you read the Bible and the Bible is literally, as it was somehow seen as literal and straightforward in the word of God. But then he, he reads this opening of Psalm 18. Um, Yeah, here we are. I will love thee, O Lord. My strength, the Lord is my stony rock, is my defense, my savior, my God, and my might in whom I trust. My buckler, it's a shield and buckler, the horn also of my salvation and my refuge. And I remember Eugene Peterson saying, how can it be a stone and a rock, how can it be a stone and a shield and a horn? all at the same time. And he had to figure it out himself, that yes, the Lord is my stony rock in all the kind of mushiness and give of the culture around me, 
set me on this firm rock. Set me on the rock that is higher than I. And yes, there is a shield and buckler. My God stands between me and the flaming darts of the earth. And, and yes, this great exaltation and glorious proclamation that's there in the horn of salvation. But nobody explained that to him. So he, Eugene B. said he had to figure it out for himself. By learning what the Psalms were, he learned what poetry was. He was given the delicious gift of metaphor. Metaphor, of course, you know that the four bit of metaphor in Greek is, is, is the same as we get the word ferry, ferros. It's about carrying something. Metaphor is about carrying something across, carrying a meaning across from an image so that it enlightens your mind. So here's the psalm. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my stony rock and my defense, my savior, my God and my might in whom I will trust, my buckler, the horn of my salvation and my refuge. Wonderful, densely packed poetry. I will call upon the Lord which is worthy to be praised. So shall I be safe from mine enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me. Then look at this change. The sorrows of death compassed me and the overflowings of ungodliness made me afraid. The pains of hell came about me, and the snares of death overtook me. We were seeing these awful pictures from the hospital wards of people being picked up and sort of rolled over and desperately breathing through all this equipment, but not breathing and feeling they were almost drowning. In my, the snares of death overtook me. In my trouble, I will call upon the Lord and complain unto my God. Wonderful. So shall he hear my voice out of his holy temple, and my complaint shall come before him, it shall enter even into his ears. And then this kind of astonishing, the earth trembled and quaked, the very foundations also of the hills shook and were removed because he was wroth. They went out a smoke from his presence and a consuming fire from his mouth. Then this wonderful, one of the great moments in the Psalter, especially if you read it in light of Christ. He, have we got to this? But let, let's just get what you want to. Here it is. He bowed the heavens also and came down. Though he was found in form equal to God, he did not cling to equality with God, but empty himself, taking the form. He bowed the heavens also and came down, and it was dark under his feet. This is wonderful. He rode upon the cherubims and did fly. He came flying upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place, his pavilion round about him with dark water and thick cloud to cover him. At the brightness of his presence, the clouds removed, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord thundered out of heaven. It's wonderful. And then we get down to this final thing. He shall send down from on high to fetch me and take me out of many waters. Now, I am not the first English poet to have been moved by the sheer dynamic power of that sequence of image and the way all the natural phenomena, the fire, the hailstones, just speak only in the faintest way of the power of the one who hears our cry and comes down to rescue us. I am not the only one. And uh, a great poet and prophet before me, William Blake, also a great artist, made a piece called David is rescued out of many waters. I hope you can see that. It's astonishing. He rode upon the cherubim. He's, Blake is completely using the, but look at who is coming down. It's not that other Blake image of the, of, of, you know, the ancient of days and the bearded figure with the dividing compasses. It's this profoundly compassionate youthful. It is Christ, because it is Christ who is prophesied in this psalm. And look at how he comes down in light and power. And there's the, the, the angels suspending him. But then look at David. Look at David on the waters there, spread out, cruciform, tangled. And, you know, the snares of death encompass me has then become ropes around. He's like a sailor out of a shipwreck, isn't he? You know, and the very... But look at how both of them in the end are cruciform. The one who comes down is the one who will stretch out his arms for us on the cross and who will enter into every one of those things, the sorrows of death, the overflowings of ungodliness, the pains of hell, the snares of death around us. That's what he will come down to deal with. And to come down to deal with it, he must come down into it and lift us up from beneath the everlasting arms are underneath. So out of many waters, 
And um, I was, I had that painting in my mind as well as the psalm when I wrote the poem in response to this. Um, so, Dilijam te domine. And I realized when I came to write this poem that I was writing not only about the fear of death that we all had, this was before the vaccine. This was when you just thought you could go out, you could get it, that's it, you'll die of asphyxiation in some horribly, you know, some room of clacking scientific instruments away from your beloved. We had that fear. But actually this went deeper for me. My conversion when it came was fairly dramatic and I was making a real mess of my life, but I was reciting the Psalms as literature not thinking there was a God behind them. And while I was in the middle of one of them, in 145 going, the Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who, the Lord is near to all such as fall. He came to me and he rescued me. So I found myself, I mean, I speak about that in my poem on Psalm 145, that came into it. So here's the poetic reflection. This is me exercising myself. By this time, poor old Maggie was a bit anxious because I was literally exercising myself day and night. Like it says, I was getting up at midnight saying, no, I've got three more poems, I can do this, you know. <laughs> you know, so great is her reward in heaven, you know, it just, you know, it's just a case like, keep him caffeinated and keep, keep out of his way, you know. <laughs> so here's how it came out. I will behold you and be satisfied. My strength, my rock, my buckler and my shield. You came to rescue me. I saw you ride the wind's swift wings. I saw the waters yield to you as you reached down to lift me out, out of the whelming panic where I reeled and flailed in fear of death. You heard my shout, my anguished cry for help and carried me and held me safe and put my fears to rout. And now you give me back my liberty. You strengthen my weak hands and set my feet to dancing lightly as a deer, as free as any in the forest and as fleet. Soon you will call and draw me in your love to that still place where earth and heaven meet. I wanted a movement from panic to calm. Interestingly, after I, I began, before the book was published, I started to sort of a kind of live blog these poems on my website with a bit, and I got correspondence. And I had a number of people who, you know, dealing with depression and dealing with mental health issues, for whom this particular poem turned out to be in, somebody who suffered from panic attacks and tried to, wrote to me and said, I have this poem written inside, <laughs> inside my purse, you know, and I've got to take it out and read it, because it says how I feel. Well, I said, well, you know, if you like that, you should try the original psalm, you know, <laughs> that's kind of like. Um, and, you know, maybe that's beginning to happen for people. Now, I wanted to put 18 and 19 together, because I wanted this before we turn to the great, in my opinion, the, the great Christocentric Psalms, the sequence from 21 um, through to 24. Uh, I want to, um, to talk about transitions. So all the time I was reading Psalm 18, I was also getting ready to write the Psalm 18 poem. I was also reading Psalm 19, which of course was a delight. You know, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork, night unto night uttereth speech. Psalm 19, by the way, was uh, C.S. Lewis's favorite psalm. I was holding, oh, what a joy. I mean, it's just, you know, I'm gonna have to, have to put this on my rider for every gig I do now. As part of my, my, my rider, I, I want to be given first editions of books owned by C.S. Lewis with his annotations. I want them placed in my hand before I do the gig. Um, now you can do that here. So I held Lewis's copy of the Book of Common Prayer with this Coverdale Psalms in it and saw it written in the back, the starred Psalms and of course 19 and then I saw 19 underlined. <laughs> This is what he says in Reflections on the Psalms. I take this to be the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. So we come to Psalm 19, but I needed to know that we were coming to Psalm 19. So out of the panic of Psalm 18, 
I end it, you draw me in your love to that still place where earth and heaven meet, so that my next poem can begin in that still place where earth and heaven meet. So here's the opening of Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. One day telleth another and one night certifieth another. There is neither speech nor language, but their voices are heard among them and their sound is gone out into all lands and their words to the ends of the world. Oh, so there is a paradox for you. Night unto night, Day, one day telleth another, one night certifieth another. There is neither speech nor language, but their voices are heard. The heavens are declaring. The other poet who really loved Psalm 19 was Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And I think it lay in some ways behind Coleridge's, when Coleridge was critiquing the materialist mechanistic view of the universe, the Newtonian scheme, what he called this whole watchmaking scheme of things, which had no place for the breath of the living God. He suggested as an alternative model that one might consider the cosmos to be an uttered thing, a kind of poem, that the phenomena of nature might be things in themselves, which could be perfectly well studied you know, in science, just like you could take a poem and do a chemical analysis of the paper and a geometric analysis of the shape of the letters and a statistical analysis of the frequency with which they were repeated. And you could come up with volumes of entirely sound scientific knowledge about it and never know it was a poem. When somebody said, oh, by the way, it's a poem, you should try reading it, it would fill you with delight and beauty and meaning, which would not in any way undermine or take away any of the perfectly sound scientific things you'd found out about the paper and the ink. It's just you discover that they're more than physical objects. So Coleridge, remember in Frost at Midnight, when he's wanting his child to grow up in the midst of nature, he says, thou my child shall wander like a breeze by lakes and sandy shores beneath the crags of it. And then he says this, do you remember, he says, not so now you can go out and take nature notes and, and, you know, study the barometric pressure. What he says is this. So shalt thou see and hear the lovely shapes and sounds intelligible of that eternal language which thy God utters, who doth teach himself in all and all things in himself. Great universal teacher, he shall mould thy spirit and by giving make it ask. The heavens, in declaring the glory of the Lord, don't need speech or language because they are speech and language. They are themselves shapes and sounds intelligible of that eternal language which thy God utters. So I thought, golly, Lewis's favorite psalm, Coleridge's favorite psalm, one of mine, no pressure then. Uh, but I had a go, and this is how it came out. And you'll see the link now. We've just had the panic of the poem that ended finally to that still place, and this is how this one begins. In that still place where earth and heaven meet under mysterious starlight, raise your head and gaze up at their glory. The complete consort dancing, as one poet said of his own words, that's T.S. Eliot, of course. Uh, the complete consort dancing, as one poet said of his own words. But these are all God's words. These are all God's words. A shining poem waiting to be read afresh in every heart. Now look towards the brightening east and see the splendid sun rise and rejoice, the icon of his Lord's true light. Be joyful with him, watch him run his course, receive the gift and treasure of his light, pouring like honeyed gold till day is done, as sweet and strong as all God's laws, as right as all his judgments and as clean and pure all given for your growth and your delight. So you can see I came probably closer there to any of them simply giving you the psalm again and <laughs> retranslating it because it's just so perfect, that psalm 19. And it was lovely to have those sort of islands of pure joy and delight um, in the midst of, of so much distress. And of course the fantastic thing about the lockdown was that suddenly the traffic had stopped, there was no fumes, the planes were not flying in the sky. You could walk out into deep darkness around it and see the stars resplendent in a way that you'd never seen them before, just as you could hear the birds in the morning in ways you'd never heard them. 
Now, I've already used up more time than I should have done, but if you'll forgive me, I do want to get <laughs> finally to the heart of these things, the real discovery for me, which was um, re-encountering Christ as my crucified and risen saviour in the Psalter, seeing him again and again. Um, Lewis says uh, in his essay on second meaning in the Psalms, in Reflections on the Psalms, two figures meet us in the Psalms, that of the sufferer and that of the conquering and liberating king. And then, brilliant, he says, our Lord identified himself with both. Both. The reason why he wasn't recognized in so many ways um, by, by the people who were meant to, to wait and welcome is that they'd only paid attention to the Messianic king. They hadn't seen that the Messiah will also be the sufferer. As Jesus says to the astonished disciples on the road to Emmaus, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he showed the places that were about him, you know. So um, I began to find Christ more and more in the figure of the poor person as well as the king. And then I found them all coming together in an astonishing sequence. 21 is the great coronation psalm of, you know, the king in glory, the king. Let's just have a quick um, look at it. Um, oh, 21 doesn't seem to have come out. I think some of these psalms have got, but let me just give you a bit of uh, Psalm 21. The king shall rejoice in thy strength, O Lord, exceeding glad of thy salvation. And uh, he says, uh, with for thou shalt prevent him with the blessings of goodness and shalt set a crown of pure gold upon his head. A crown of pure gold upon his head. So wonderful. 21, coronation psalm, lovely. But of course, I'm reading 21 and 22 together because that's how this deal works. My landing place at the end of 21 has to be my springboard for 22. And I'm thinking, what is this? Thou shalt crown him with pure gold. And then I'm, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me and art so far from my health and from the words of my complaint, I cry to thee in the daytime. And what I see, of course, these are the very words that are on the lips of Christ. And what kind of a crown is he wearing? A crown of thorns, corona spinia, not corona ara. And you know all the way through that astonishing psalm. So, uh, my poem for 21 seems not to have come out here, so I'm going to um, read it to you. Uh, but it goes a bit further, so let's just go through the sequence, for, think about it for a minute. I now understand that though he was found in form equal to God, we have to hear 21 before we get to 22 because we need to know the crown he set aside in order to win a crown that will not be his alone as the only begotten son, but will be our crown that he calls us to reign with him. But in order to do that, he has to wear the crown of thorns of our suffering. He goes right down into the suffering. And then, of course, that is the great psalm of his dying. And then... But of course, while I was working on Psalm 22, I had to be reading Psalm 23. And I'm like, this is a little, talk about a roller coaster ride, you know. This is like absolute agony and I'm poured out like water and I'm a worm and no man and you know, all the fat bull. And then, oh, the Lord is my shepherd and it's very beautiful and I, you know, green pastures. But then I looked at it again. I thought, this is astonishing. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Now, I was very lucky to visit the, the Holy Land once, and I was walking out with Maggie, my wife, along the Wadi Kelt in the Judean wilderness. And they are these wonderful, these, these sharply shadowed little valleys. They're narrow paths. And we thought we were pretty much on our own. It was great to get away from the crowds in Jerusalem. And suddenly we heard this weird kind of, kind of shrilly, pipey sort of sound. And around the corner... <laughs> along the thing came this little Palestinian shepherd boy leaving, leading a bunch of ragged sheep who didn't look too best pleased with going along this. But obviously they heard the shepherd's music and they, they, they were following him. And suddenly I got Psalm 23. You know, I always thought about 
you know, one man and his dog and, you know, driving the sheep in front of you. But of course not. In those days, when the pasture near the village was dried up, you had to take your sheep out to a higher pasture. And you had to go along these narrow paths, sharply shadowed. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Thou art with me. Good. Okay, now God is... But how can he do that? This is Yahweh. He is eternal. He sits above the earth and the inhabitants of the earth are like grasshoppers. He's immortal. How can he die? But he can't lead me along that particular path to that higher pasture unless he too goes through the grave and gate of death. Then he could do it. So there's David all those hundreds of years before Christ saying, no, he's going to come. He's going to be a shepherd. I was a shepherd boy. I know what this is. And he's going to lead from the front. And that's going to be an assurance for all of us. You never, you do not have to make that journey alone, that dark journey. There's going to be somebody holding your hand who says, don't worry, I've been this way before. I know the way. I will fear no evil, thou art with me. Now I know why Psalm 23 comes after Psalm 22. That from the crown of heaven in 21 down to the crown of thorns, now he leads me through. Okay, he's leading me through. But he's going to ascend into heaven. What about me? Psalm 24. (laughs) Who shall ascend the holy hill? Even he that hath clean hands and a pure heart. But how can I do it? So the fact that I was reading 24 while I was reading, while I was working on 23. So I don't know how far. I think all the poems haven't quite um, come through here. That's the 22 one. But let me read you 21. uh, Just so before we go into, into this. So my, time, my, my poem on Psalm 21 was this. Now may you find in Christ riches and rest. May you be blessed in him and he in you, in heaven, where to grant you your request is always blessing. For your heart is true, true to yourself, and true to Christ your King. Breathe through this coronation psalm and view the glory of his golden crown. Then sing the exaltation, goodness, life, and power, the blessing and salvation Christ will bring. This is still me on 21 before we get there. But first, he wears a darker crown. The hour is coming and has come. Our Lord comes down into the heart of all our hurts to wear with us the sharp corona spin a crown of thorns and to descend with us to death before he shares with us the golden crown. And then comes my one on 22, which is up there. Before he shares with us the golden crown, he comes to share with us the crown of thorns. Our hurts and hates close in and hem him round, mock and humiliate him. All the scorns with which we blaspheme God in one another are concentrated here among the horns of unicorns, the lion's mouths, the slather of our devouring wickedness. He takes it all and turns it into love. He gathers all of us and by atonement, makes our peace with God. He speaks to us of mercy even as we pierce him. No one slakes his thirst. I tremble at the mystery for Christ himself is crying through this psalm to suffer my own dereliction for me. Now that penultimate line Christ himself is crying through this psalm really became for me as I wrote it the key to everything else to the rest of the Psalter that this is this Psalter is not only my inner prayer life it's Christ's inner prayer life so um, Psalm 23 the beauties of the Lord my shepherd I need hardly remind you of it we talked about the beauty of that line about the valley of the shadow of death 23 for my poem picks up on that last line, to suffer my own dereliction for me. Here's how it goes. To suffer my own dereliction for me, to be my shepherd and to lead me through the grave and gate of death in strength and mercy, Christ has come down. At last, I found the true shepherd and the false just fade away before him. I will sing of how he drew me from the snares I set myself, 
how day dawned on my darkness, how he brought me forth, converted me, and opened up the way for me, and led me gently on that path, led me beside still waters, promised me that he'd be with me all my days on earth, and when my last day comes, accompany and comfort me as evening shadows fall and draw me into his eternity. And then I thought, oh, well, 22, 23, so it works. And then, as I say, I discovered 24. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall rise up in that holy place? Even he that hath clean hands and a pure heart, that hath not lift up his mind to vanity, nor sworn to deceive his neighbor. Oh, dear. Well, that leaves me out then. <laughs> my mother used to check. My mother's full of the Psalms. I mean, just, she just had a memory of everything. And she used to say to us before supper, if we'd washed our hands, have you clean hands and a pure heart, dear? And I would go like, well, one out of two ain't bad, you know. And so he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation and this wonderful, lift up your heads, O ye lift, lift up the gates. The king of glory shall come in. Great, bully for the king of glory. What about me? Now I discover, though, that because I've died in Christ, because I rise in Christ, I'm going to ascend in Christ. You know, the great high priest on the Day of Atonement just had, had the names of the tribes of Israel sewn into his robe. But we have a great high priest who has passed into the heavens who carries us. You have died and your lives are hidden with Christ in God. So that had to come out somehow. You'll see now by this time I was unashamedly Christocentric in the whole reading of the Psalms. I thought, I'm just going to go for it, you know, and deal with the flat later. So... Um, Remember the last line was, he will comfort me as evening shadows and draw me into his eternity. I thought 24 made, I needed a question mark here. And draw me into his eternity. But who can rise up to that holy place? Can all its splendors really be for me? Before that holy fire, I hide my face. My hands were never clean. As for my heart, He'll search out its impurity and trace the sources of its sin in every part and in the whole its weariness and stain. Who can ascend? I cannot even start. But even as I fear my hopes are vain, my Saviour comes. His love revives my hope. I feel him search my wounds, deal with my pain, and offer me again the healing cup. Raising my head, he says, now rise with me. The gates will open for us both. Look up. I'm going to pause on that look up and finish. I think I'd love to take you, hey, got time for 150 Psalms? Maybe not. Hey. Um, but we make our journey and eventually we come back to that great that great doxology and we come again to the place where every breath is praise but I could praise all the more because I went down I went down into the whelming panic of 18 I went down into the crucifixion of 22 and later on into the desolation of 88 and and now I felt as we went up and down I mean you know the pandemic has been a bit of a roller coaster ride has it not in a curious way, I felt this whole Psalter was, was just had me at every drop and curve and gave me the language, gave me the license to tell God exactly how I felt and gave me the very language in which to do it. And more promised me that Christ knows exactly what I'm feeling as I utter a psalm of despair in despair because he has uttered that psalm too, this whole Psalter has been on his lips. Christ himself is crying through this psalm. Christ himself is praising through this psalm. Lewis said that he felt Christ, the poetry of Christ's own teaching owed something to the poetry of the psalms. And I found the exercise of a making a creative or artistic response to the creative artistry of the psalms itself brought me back to Christ, whom in one way Coleridge called the prime genial artist. So maybe that's a good note to end on for your year of arts, faith and imagination and particularly tonight launching uh, your poetry month. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>